Hello once again, everybody. Thank you for joining me here on this Thursday, November 26th edition of ATS Radio. I'm your host, Adam Burke. I'll be joined today by professional better and handicapper Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com. Chat in college football week 13, NFL week 12. Lots of breakdowns, thoughts, analysis, stats, trends, all that good stuff along the way here on today's show. Happy Thanksgiving to our listeners out there, whether you're celebrating with family or you're just staying home, cooking in, whatever you're doing. Hope you all stay safe out there on this Thanksgiving holiday and hope you're able to get some of those good Black Friday deals, which I'm sure most of us will be doing online here uh, for this holiday season. Over at ATS.io, lots of great stuff going on, lots of things you want to pay close attention to. Speaking of Black Friday, some very good Black Friday promotions from BetMGM Sportsbook. In fact, this weekend over at BetMGM, if you sign up through ATS.io, You'll get a 100% deposit match bonus and $25 on the house over at BetMGM. Terms and conditions do apply, but if you head over to ATS.io, you can see which states you can take advantage of that promotion. Also, BetMGM giving you a $10 free bet just because it's Black Friday for account holders over there at that sportsbook. Lots of top sportsbook promotions being covered over at ATS.io. We encourage you to check that out. And we also encourage you to download the ATS app, which you can find in the Google Play Store or in the Apple Store. As I've talked about before, make sure you search against the spread instead of ATS. There are a lot of other things named ATS, but against the spread uh, is what you want to search for there. Or you can go over to the website, ATS.io, click on the button, whether you have an Android device or an Apple device, that will take you directly to the app in the Google Play Store or in the Apple Store. Finally, one thing I want to mention here at the top of today's show, we are recording this on Tuesday afternoon. In fact, pretty early Tuesday afternoon. Wanted to make sure we got a show out every day for you this week, but recorded this Tuesday afternoon for the Thursday edition of ATS Radio. So I guarantee you that some of these lines will have moved by the time you hear this show. If you have any questions, I'm at Skating Tripods on Twitter, and this is as good a time as any to bring in professional better Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com at Brad Powers and the number seven on Twitter. I'm sure he'll be happy to answer your questions as well. But Brad, how's it going today, man? It's going well. Good to hear your voice. Good to chat with you, man. Always great to hang out here with you. And, uh, you know, it's pretty ironic. I want to start with this. I recorded on Monday for the Wednesday show with Kyle Hunter, and and he was off of a tough weekend in college football in the NFL. And uh, we both talked about how therapeutic this show can be at times. And I know you and I have used it for the same purpose here in the past. Yeah, I had an okay college Saturday. Uh, I mean, I can't believe the Oregon game was my major hang-up on that one and then Penn State. But other than that, I, I did okay. NFL is completely, I mean, just a shit show. So uh, <laughs> I, I just, I, I can't win this year. <laughs> so, well, it's coming up. We still got, you know, six weeks left. But uh, I, I did, it's it's going to be my worst NFL season. So, is what it is at this point. You got, you got to keep plugging away. You can't wave the white flag. Uh, just, you got to trust your process, and maybe you chalk it up to 2020, or maybe you chalk it up to yeah, you got you got to make some radical changes in the uh, for next year. Well, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, yeah, last week in the NFL was a tough one for a lot of people. I did manage to go three and two in the circa, but the circa win rate was like 40.5 percent or something like that. It's got to be an all time low. It was an all-time low for the Circa, and I I don't know if it's an all-time low in the Super Contest. I'm pretty sure it is, but the Super Contest was like 35% and change. Like nine of the top 10 most popular picks got beat. Top five consensus in both contests went 0-5. So we'll talk more about the NFL later in today's show, but uh, it seemed like it was a rough NFL weekend for a lot of people last week. And, you know... Look, we talked about a lot of different things on Wednesday's show with Kyle Hunter, and you and I have talked about a lot of different things here with regards to COVID and just the challenges that it presents from a handicapping standpoint. And, you know, there were a couple of games, and and I reached out to you early in the week, and I'm like, what the hell is going on with this Miami of Ohio number against Akron? Open 14 really hasn't, you know, the the worldwide opener was, was, you know, pretty much in that 14 range. Hasn't really moved a whole lot. But that's one where I feel like there's a major mispricing there. Same thing with Southern Miss and UAB, which now has moved up to 20. But it feels like these teams coming off of COVID, whether it's been well publicized or not, 
it's like their power rating at the open has been dropped like a touchdown, you know, regardless of who's actually in or who's out. Yeah, and I I happen to bet both those sides, those two favorites, Miami, Ohio, and UAB. Uh, maybe an overreaction or maybe not. Maybe maybe these teams coming off a little bit of a break that, that had some COVID issues. Maybe we're getting to the point where, you know, coming back, maybe it's just not going to matter. So uh, that would be the concern and the hang-up. But one thing that's been pretty solid for me, even in this season, has been my power ratings, and that's what I, I'm doing when I'm betting those early lines. So uh, I'm going to trust my my numbers, even w- with everything that's going on right now. But uh, those are two favorites I did bet early in the week. I, I had overlays in both of those games. Yeah, and I, I mean, I just – I don't know. I mean, obviously, none of us know how to accurately, you know, evaluate what COVID means to a team's power rating, to a line, anything like that, because we've never had this before. So – you know, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens with those two games, but I know uh, both you and I on UAB here and Miami of Ohio for this week. One thing I do want to ask you about here, Brad, to open up today's show is that while it's not a full-fledged rivalry week because some conferences started so late in the process and kind of pushed back some of their rivalry games, we do still have a ton of them here this year. And obviously, again, like everything else, or this week, excuse me, again, like everything else this year, you know, Things are a little bit different. Won't be a lot of fans if there are any for some of these rivalry games, stuff like that. But, you know, you hear all the usual narratives of, well, you you could throw out the records. You could throw out the numbers. You know, none of it matters in a rivalry game. I always bet the dog in the rivalry game. These all seem like very dangerous points of view to take. So I'm curious what your thoughts are and if your handicapping changes at all when it comes to rivalry games. Uh, maybe in a normal season, it might, uh, this season, I'm not going to even speculate, uh, just an, another unknown variable, uh, m- maybe some teams step up to the plate, but, uh, I, I mean, it's, <laughs> I, it, it did, I, I can tell you this when, when I was betting on Sunday morning, the circle opening lines, it didn't even get, you know, come across my thought process. Oh, rivalry game. Got to take the dog here or whatever. Uh, I'm not even, I'm not going to complicate the muddy waters even further uh, by that entering my thought process. I mean, certainly I think it'll matter for in some, but uh, overwhelmingly, I, I don't think you, you should be betting blindly on it, even in a, a normal year. Well, and that is one of those things too, where, you know, I, I do think it gets overblown to a degree. I mean, look, look back at Oklahoma state, and Oklahoma last weekend. I mean, that's a rivalry game. It's a one-sided rivalry game. And dismissing the fact that Oklahoma has simply dominated that head to head, I think was a major mistake that, you know, some people made last week. Fortunately, the line moved while I was writing an article and I, it got to seven and I thought, you know, I'm not going to bother with this. And, you know, it saved me from another loser on Saturday when I had a terrible day, but like you think back to, you know, Washington state and Washington, the last several years in the apple cup, of course, that one canceled this year when, it would have looked a lot different with Jimmy Lake and Nick Rolovich instead of Chris Peterson and Mike Leach, but Peterson owned Leach. And it was something yep. you simply had to factor into the handicap. So there really aren't as many extreme examples as what we have with, you know, the Apple cup uh, or Bedlam, but you know, still, I mean, to me, those things factor into my handicap more in rivalry games because one team just, has another team's number whether it's you know preparing better for them recruiting better just having more talent whatever the case may be those are things that I will pay attention to though they won't be sole justifications for a bet one way or the other I think you bring up a good point the one thing that I do take into consideration when it's rival is, is I do look back at the, probably the series history more than I do just to your normal matchup. So yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. It, it, that does enter my thought process. What has been going on in the series? Obviously, if you got new coaching staffs and whatnot, I, I think it's less relevant. But yeah, I th- 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 that's where a rivalry game is different. You know, the, how, how does this you know get game shake out uh, as far as recent he- series history? And uh, <laughs> just a quick point. I heard Chris Fowler on the broadcast. Hey, anything can happen in Bedlam. I had something like that. He said, I'm like, what are you talking about? Anything can happen in Bedlam. Oklahoma's dominated this series, whether it's the 1920s, the 1940s, 50s, hell, even the last 15, 20 years when Oklahoma State's been pretty good. Oklahoma dominates this series. What do you mean anything can happen in Bedlam? Oklahoma dominates. That's what happens. 
you know, what is it? 16 of 18 now for Oklahoma and 12. Exactly. Of 16 yeah. of 18 and Oklahoma States had their best 15 year run in, in the history of the program. And still, I mean, Oklahoma treats them like their little kid brother. And uh, that was thankfully one of my plays that I had. I didn't overthink it. Oklahoma right now, I think is a top five team the way they're playing. Yeah, Oklahoma's definitely looking very, very strong. I know you mentioned this on Twitter, and again, make sure you follow Brad on Twitter, at Brad Powers in the number seven, where, you know, I'm, I'm sure people don't want to see it, given what's happened with Oklahoma in, you know, semifinals here in recent years, but there's a very realistic possibility that, you know, they could end up being that fourth team in that discussion. So I know you're pretty high on the Sooners. Oh, right I don't think that – I don't think they get in there. I'm just saying okay. if you're just going off a of pure Vegas power rating – they're in the mix and I mean if they continue the the current trajectory uh, I mean they're they're not going to make it to the playoff but this might actually be the the Oklahoma team that could actually compete in one of those semifinals even though they're not going to get that opportunity with two losses unless all hell breaks loose here but I'm just saying you know keep in mind Oklahoma don't forget them you know next year I mean uh, this is going to be a team that brings a lot of people back next year uh, so uh, Oklahoma is going to be in my preseason top five for 2021. Well, my apologies for that. Taking your tweet out of context there, I guess. I No, uh, that's all right. That's, I, I that's fine. Just, you know, it, it, there's shit. There's so much stuff on Twitter nowadays. And I, I, I follow too many people. Not that I'm going to unfollow you, but I just, I got a lot of bullshit on the timeline that, uh, you know, I probably don't need that no. sort of takes away from you know, the, the more important stuff that's out there. But that is another talking point here is, you know, Look, Twitter's a great news source for a variety of different things, but a lot of these colleges not being forthcoming about what's going on with COVID, and I can't blame them for that. You know, there's obviously HIPAA gray areas and, you know, gamesmanship and all those types of things, and uh, God, I'm sure we're going to see it with college basketball where we're going to find out five minutes before tip that somebody's not playing or, you know, somebody's in contact tracing or or whatever else. I, I genuinely feel bad for people that, you know, make their nut on college basketball with, how weird that's going to be, but you know, again, man, I mean, as this goes forward here, as we keep getting spikes and you know, again, we've seen that this illness to a degree has kind of been geographic in nature. So, you know, maybe it does start to push further South a little bit. This just continues to be a hardship, man. And, and I'm not going to say that college football is completely unbettable right now. Cause otherwise no one would listen to the show and, you know, we got to keep swinging away as much as we can, but the, the, the timing of these COVID announcements and, and when we actually find out who's playing and who's not like every week with Boise state, we find out some impact players not playing five minutes before the game. I, <laughs> man, it's frustrating. It is. So, you know, I, I'm keeping back of my uh, circuit bets each and every, the world openers on Sunday mornings. And, you know, I'm hitting 60% for the year, but I can tell you the last two weeks to your point about college football being almost unbettable right now, uh, I am, I have a losing record the last two weeks. I'm 15, 18 and one probably would have 10 or 12 more bets in there, but the games have been canceled and I have beaten the closing line on those 34 games. I think on 32 of them by an average of about three and a half points per game, beating the closing line. And yet I have a losing record the last two weeks. So when people, you know, say guaranteed winners and whatnot, uh, I, I can't drive this home enough there isn't, there isn't any guarantees. I mean, I laid 13 and a half with Oregon last week. Uh, that was before the announcement that UCLA would be without their starting quarterback. Still didn't even come close to sniffing that game. Probably should have lost the game outright. Laid three with UTSA. That line closes nine. I, I pushed that game. I, I mean, it's, it's unbelievably tough to win right now. Uh, even betting very soft world opening lines, I, I'm not having much success. Well, and before we dive into the games for this week, I think it's a really important lesson for our listeners. And we talked about this on Wednesday's show, and I I will hammer this point home until I'm blue in the face and six feet under or whatever it is. All you can control is getting the best of the number possible. That's it. Whatever happens after that, you have no control over that whatsoever, unless you're live betting, trading the game, whatever the case may be. As far as pre-flop straight betting goes, All you can do is get the best possible number. If you're consistently beating the market, you are going to win long-term. If you're consistently beating the market and you're having a rough season, it's probably variance or COVID or something else. And, uh, you know, I feel for the people like you, like Kyle, like other people that, you know, I've talked to that are consistently beating the market and just not getting the results. Frustrating. 
<laughs> it's happened to me in the past. Uh, uh, <laughs> but you know, when it happens consistently, it, it is tough, but, but again, I'm having a really good season as far as that betting goes. But again, I am not only a better, but I also sell information. I sell picks sort of say, and it, it, it is become increasingly tough to win even a midweek type market right now, because, you know, not to go off another tangent, market's getting shaped up earlier than ever before. So, uh, and I, I done, done a Twitter poll and most people don't bet until late in the week, let alone maybe even game day. Uh, it's become, uh, <laughs> uh some things are going to have to change as far as me in the future. But, uh, I guess the, the point to be driven home here, w- winning stuff, even when you are consistently getting the absolute best of the number, it's still really tough to do. This is not easy. It's not called winning. It's called gambling. No, absolutely. And again, I mean, that's the best indicator of future success beating the market. But, you know, we know in this business that absolutely nothing is guaranteed. And, and furthermore, too, I mean, you're beating the market and we're getting significant game day movement, too, which is something that I mean, I'm not just, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that this never happens. But the degree of game day movement, the sharp involvement that is moving the market on game day, once the picture is clear, once we know who's playing and who isn't, I don't ever remember a year like this. And and I know we've, we've beaten this point to death throughout the season, but still, I mean, you know, again, it's, it's one of those things to me where this is just a season that, that I've never seen before. And I've, you know, been fully invested in this business for a decade. I've been, you know, betting for 15 years and, and following along and taking an interest in the markets and, this is unlike anything I've ever seen. And, and you know, I, I do wonder going forward, you know, if the game day movement, if the game day money is just the norm now, if it's just because sharp influential money is not playing Thursday, Friday, the way it used to, stuff like that. So, you know, again, I mean, if, if this is your first year betting, and obviously there are probably a lot of new bettors this year with all the states that have legalized, uh, you know, this is, <laughs> this is not a great first impression. I don't <laughs> no, unless you're winning. I mean, I, I do, I do know, you know, a c- couple guys that I follow and I, I try to follow the entire market uh, as many guys as possible. I, I mean, I do know a couple guys are winning overwhelmingly. Uh, you know, the amount of people uh, are losing this year. Uh, but you know, some people might be winning and having some success. I can tell you this, if you're having a ton of success, uh, I would not put this year, whether you're winning or losing and, and say, Hey, this is the end all I figured it out. Sort of say, or, or, or don't be down on your luck too much when it comes to 2020, I would, again, no matter what your results are for this year, I, I would, I would take it with a grain of salt is what I, I'm trying to say. Well, and, you know, again, I, like I use my show here as, you know, a platform and also feel like I'm sitting in a therapist chair when I'm talking to the listeners or talking to my guests because I, I sort of lament a lot of the things that are going on. I kind of talk through my thoughts, my emotions, this and that. I do the same thing with my intro to my power ratings article, which I do every, usually on Sunday evenings over at ATS.io. And you know, something I was thinking about is that, you know, a lot of us in this business, anybody that takes this business seriously, we pride ourselves on our ability to adapt and adjust because you'll have some bad weeks or you'll have some power ratings that are out of whack or some angles that you're not looking at properly. And you'll make those adjustments. You'll make those corrections and things will kind of level off. And this year it's like, I don't even know how to adapt. I don't even know how to adjust. You know, like I started severely lowering the worst teams in the country. Now I come to find out that I've got them too low or, you know, I've been chasing power ratings with certain teams all year long. I, I just, I don't know how much adapting and adjusting can be done to a season that is, is just this unique. It's, uh, I, it's something that, you know, obviously I, I've dealt with one thing that I, my power rings have been good. I, I need to stick to my power rings. They are consistently better than my own personal handicapping. I overthink things. I cannot emphasize this enough. This is a note to Brad powers himself go buy your power rings because my power rings even this year have been good <laughs> in, in college football. I should say I'm an originator college football. I, I don't do uh, much when, when it comes to pure power rating in, in the NFL, but I, the one thing that I've done is even in this year, don't overreact. I, I, you know, with a few exceptions, uh, obviously there are a few exceptions uh, like, you know, temple down to a fifth string quarterback or whatnot, but overwhelmingly, 
I don't over adjust. Usually I found maybe I'm way off in the market one week, the market will come back around, you know, within a couple of weeks. So I, I, I'm not swinging teams six, seven points power ratings. Like I feel like the market is with some of these teams this year. I'm still right in line where, you know, a major adjustment for me at this point, and I know it's not, you know, the same for everybody because Pac-12 teams, some of them only played a couple games, but uh, I'm only swinging teams a couple of points. Uh, and that, that's extreme at this point in the season. So I have found success not overreacting. And I, I guess that would be, that would be what I would say even this year in a wild year. And that would be my, my thought process in a normal year. Don't be, if you're confident in your power running, especially late in the season, you're making a mistake swinging those teams, unless it's quarterback injury or whatnot related. Don't be swinging your power ratings on teams more than three points at this point in the season. You're making a mistake if you're doing it. Well, of course, you know, I don't know what percentage of our listeners do power ratings. I don't know what percentage of our listeners read mine, read your newsletter, subscribe to your newsletter, whatever. There are also other options. You know, you can look statistically, you know, put together a spreadsheet of stats, you know, yards per play differentials and, you know, a lot of the other advanced metrics that are out there. Or you can just use the traditional stuff, box score study, look for those misleading games, things of that sort. Those things are still tried and true and they will still work. You know, at least in terms of getting ahead of the market, whatever happens after that, you know, remains to be seen. But at least in terms of getting ahead of the market, getting a frame of reference for what you want to do throughout the week, box score study, looking at the stats. There are a lot of good places out there to do that. Now, uh, you know, those are all things that you can use in your toolbox to try and have success. All right. So as I said, we are recording this Thursday show on Tuesday afternoon. I assure you that some of these lines will have moved. Again, if you've got follow-up questions, at Skating Tripods on Twitter is me, at Brad Powers, the number seven on Twitter is Brad. And of course, use your best judgment. If we talk about a game and, you know, it's moved out of range, you know, maybe it's a game that we don't like anymore. So use your best judgment with that. But Brad, let's start Friday here. And uh, you've been awful critical of Notre Dame on this show, awful critical of Notre Dame in the betting markets. They are a four and a half point favorite total anywhere from 66 to 67 here to take on the Tar Heels in Chapel Hill. Huge game for both of these teams here. Certainly is. Um, maybe even the best game uh, of the entire weekend. I, I know ABC sent their, their A team there, you know, Kirk and Chris Fowler and whatnot on a Friday afternoon game. So that shows you how important it is. Pure power rating, I'm right in line here. 4.2 is what I have it. Uh, I maybe I lean North Carolina, but they're just too high variance for me. I guess what I would I would not be surprised Notre Dame wins this game by by two touchdowns. I'm not surprised North Carolina wins the game outright. I just it really depends on what North Carolina team is going to show up. And I mean, we've seen a different North Carolina team show up in, in different parts of multiple games so far this season. So that would be my hang up with, with the Tar Heels. They just haven't been consistent uh, in playing a full 60 minutes uh, throughout most of their games. One hangup I'd have on Notre Dame would be that they have two starting offensive linemen out. That's been the hallmark of this year's team. That's the strength of the team has been the offensive line, and they've been healthy not only this year but but last year as well. A lot of consistency, and now they're going to have two guys out for the first time this season. So, okay, a game I'm not, just not going to have too much uh, be involved in pre flop. Yeah, I think this is a quintessential live betting game. I said the same. I said as much as you did on Wednesday. I said, look. I'm not surprised if North Carolina gets trucked. I'm not surprised if North Carolina wins. They are a very high variance team. Yep. And the question here, I think, and, and Notre Dame has looked very good offensively at times this year, put up a bunch of points on Pitt, obviously move the ball, you know, against Clemson, as, as we all talked about on the show here. Do they have to get into the 40s to win this game? If they do, you know, can they do it again? You know, that's, I think that's kind of the big question here in this one is, you know, does Notre Dame hold Sam Howell and this North Carolina offense down? Do they play a ball control style, stay on the field, stuff like that? Are they comfortable playing a shootout now, which they've already won against Clemson? I don't know, but I agree with you. I think as far as watchability, this could very well be the best game of the weekend. As far as bettability, it's not one that I love at all. Yeah, maybe the, if you're looking for something pre-flop, that, that's all. I mean, I, I can't make a case really for the under uh, unless uh, there's some weather that gets involved. I I, I do see points uh, <laughs> no matter what. I mean, I could see Notre Dame winning a blowout, but, but also scoring 50 points in the process. 
Uh, you know, I'll say this. I think they're a lot more comfortable winning a shootout now after the Clemson game. And certainly after Ian Book has raised his game here in his fifth year as, uh, as the quarterback at Notre Dame, uh, the last couple of games have probably been his best back-to-back performances. So I, I certainly, I don't know if I could have said that a month ago that Notre Dame would be comfortable in a shootout. Uh, I, I think after their last two performances against BC and Clemson, I think that, that, that they'd be comfortable going score for score. So if you really have to get involved pre-flop here, oh, I mean, the money's come in already. I only expect it to go higher. I, I would lean over. All right, so game 143-144. Again, recording on Tuesday afternoon. These lines probably will have moved around a little bit. Iowa State and Texas. Interesting little one here. Texas, one-and-a-half-point favorite, total of 57. And, you know, for Iowa State, quite possibly their most complete game of the year was last week against Kansas State. Meanwhile, Texas hasn't played in 20 days. So what do you think about this one? I got it at pick. Uh, I, I would lean Iowa State. They've just been more the more consistent team here. I know Texas, you know, if we're just going by recruiting rankings, they, they, they deserve to be more than a one-and-a-half point favorite. But I just – I Iowa State, to me, uh, they, like you said, played their best game of the season. I know Kansas State was shorthanded, but uh, to me – uh, if, if they can replicate anything close to that, then, then obviously forget the point spread. They'll, they'll beat Texas outright. I, again, not, not going to be a big time bet for me, but uh, unless it goes to three, but, but certainly I, I am leaning Cyclones here. I do have Utah state, a small favorite in this or not Utah state. I, I will never have Utah state favorite. In a game. <laughs> Let me fix that. I have Iowa state favorite in this game here, short favorite uh, on the road at Texas. And, you know, this is an interesting one because much like last week's game with Kansas State and Iowa State, both of these coaches are better in the dog roll. And you know, it is Iowa State in the dog roll here, albeit a much smaller dog than Kansas State was last week. But that's one, and I talked about this on Wednesday, and you know, I talked about it on Monday's show that I did solo. When that Iowa State Kansas State line never moved, I knew I was dead in the water because yeah. that's a spot where Kansas State should take money. But you know, again, I guess I didn't account for all the COVID cases that they had, and maybe Iowa State's just a little bit better than I thought. But this is one where if the line does move, and it is a, a you know significant move at that, it's going to be sharp money. So I will pay close attention to see where the money comes in on this game. Like you, I think Iowa State is the easier team to bet here. But if Texas takes money, I think that's going to be a ringing endorsement for the Longhorns. Yeah, and when will this – it's a unique week, obviously, with the Thanksgiving, and this is an early start time uh, on a Friday. So I, I'm not sure how much the public's going to be involved on in this game. So well, when does the money happen? Yeah, I, I can't with confidence say, but if you see something getting bet on this game on Wednesday, like during the middle of the NFL games, uh, that movement right there I would consider to be sharp. So if, if it's Wednesday in the middle of the afternoon, and this game get, gets hit pretty good one, one way, whether it's Texas to three or Iowa State flips a favorite. I, I, that would be my best guess on when the sharp money is going to show for this one. What do you think about the game right below it on the board here? Nebraska and Iowa, Iowa 13 and a half point favorite, total 52 and a half. Um, you know, Nebraska, again, you know, a team that at least this year, they kind of flew under the radar to a degree. Last year, everyone expected them to take that big leap, and then they just didn't. It's the same thing again this year. I mean, turnovers, bad quarterback play, poor red zone efficiency. They've moved the ball. They just haven't had any success when they've actually moved it. I don't think Iowa is as good as their current standing. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I, I couldn't take Nebraska here, I don't think. Uh, I concur with that. I Pure power rating would say maybe a slightly Nebraska. I got it at 12 and a half. That's where I am, uh, too. I... That's where I would go. I just, you know, getting a feel for it, maybe I was just a little too overvalued, although I thought that last week and got my teeth kicked out of my throat uh, when they went into Happy Valley and took care of the Nittany Lions. I just, I I would say I trust Iowa more, but I mean, again, that's why they're laying 13 and a half. I just don't think it's a, a good role for Iowa to be laying near two touchdowns in this one. So uh, another game would be in, I'd be interested in Nebraska if it got to 14 and a half. Other than that, I, I don't expect to have too much of a pre-flop bet. It's also really tough, and maybe this is a mental block that I need to get over, but when I've got a pretty pedestrian offense like Iowa and they're laying two touchdowns, 
to me, all that says is their defense has very little margin for error for them to cover this number. And maybe their defense is good enough to do it, but for whatever reason, and, and again, maybe this is something I need to get over. I'm just far more comfortable in taking a great offense and a marginal defense with a big number than a marginal offense and a great defense. I agree with you, but I mean, this is also an Iowa team that's put up 35 or more in the last three games. So they haven't had problems scoring uh, at least recently, but historically, and that's, you want to go more historically, I think, I mean, to get bigger data sample sizes, I just, you know, Iowa isn't a very high variance program and, historically did this i mean i'll i'll look it up as we're talking here i I just i can't imagine that iowa especially in in conference play as a double digit favorites uh winning proposition again i'll i'll query it as we're talking here yeah well i guess we'll stay on friday then while you look that up and, and just go to game 201 202 central michigan and eastern michigan this one has moved up. Central's gone from five to seven, 59 and a half the total here. Second leg of the Michigan Mac trophy rivalry. Western, of course, beating Central last week. This is an interesting one because I, I think Central Michigan is probably better than their data points so far. And the market seems to agree with that assessment. They do here. And uh I'm I apologize. This is bad podcast. What game are, are we hitting now? I was typing in the query on that. Well, did, did <laughs> you, you know me? I don't do that often. Did you get the results for the query? I guess we I did not. It came up like an error. So that's why I missed the game. I'm like, what am I missing here? Uh, 47 percent Iowa uh, okay. as a double digit favorite. That's going back since 1980. Uh, right. And, you know, Trent d- doesn't look good here recently. Uh, if you go uh, d- to 2005 it's like uh, 43 percent so my in, in, initial gut instinct there what was correct that they're not a good double digit favorite and i apologize for missing part of your game that's yeah. all right central michigan and eastern michigan i talked about the line move talked about how you know there is a trophy on the line here the michigan mac trophy uh western beating central last week a ton of big plays for western michigan they averaged 32 yards per catch in that game against Central. I don't think Eastern Michigan marches up and down the field the same way. No, they don't. Uh, a, a really tight number, though, here. I, I have it at 7. or act, I mean, to be real specific, 6.9 and the line 7. So I don't. I think the number is about correct in, in this instance. Uh, disappointed, as far as I'm concerned, with Central last week. I, I thought I bet them, and, and they lost. I bet both teams. And lost, so I didn't have a good pulse on either one of these teams last week. They disappointed. It seems about right. I mean, if you really had to get involved here, I'd probably lean Eastern Michigan. Just consistently over time, them in the underdog role under their head coach Chris Creighton has been a, a profitable uh, the, 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 the role for them, whether it's uh, on the road or at home. Looks like it wants to maybe push towards seven and a half. So th- that's what th- that'll be. My buy price would be Eastern Michigan plus seven and a half. All right, so let's go to Saturday here. Game 157-158, a game where I think the wrong team is favored. I'm not sure I want to get involved, though. Georgia Southern and Georgia State here down in the Sun Belt. Apparently, they call this rivalry modern-day hate, which, I mean, hey, I kind of like it, but I'm sure that that (laughs) that'll be changed here on the not-too-distant future. Uh, But Georgia Southern now a a one-and-a-half-point favorite after opening a dog and the total 52-and-a-half. You know, I got Georgia Southern one, so I, I I agree with the initial move, but it's it's something that I, I I didn't look to bet, even though you know Georgia State opened that favorite there. It's not something I, I circled immediately to bet Georgia Southern because I had a little bit of a power ratings uh, disparity there. Be interested to see how Georgia Southern picks themselves off the mat after you know the, the debacle at the end of the Army game last week, where they could, obviously could have won that game. Georgia State's been playing pretty well and coming off one of their better performances of the season. Uh, again, it's one and I hate to be saying it so far uh, in the games that we've discussed. Right now, at one and a half, it's just it's it's not bettable for me. It's right on my power rating. No, that's fine. I mean, we're just jumping around the card. We didn't really discuss games or anything like that beforehand to find any really strong positions. So we're just kind of jumping around the board here. I'm sure we'll find some as we move forward. I, I like Georgia State. I, I like Sean. Right. I think he's done a good job. You know, and, and, I agree. and also, too, I really expected Georgia State to drop off dramatically, losing Dan Ellington, who really did just about everything for that team last year. Cornelius Brown has been almost as good, if not better. So 
I, I kind of like the trajectory of this Georgia State program right now. And and for Georgia Southern, they're so one dimensional. They just don't feel trustworthy unless they're going to be able to, you know, really rip off a good yards per carry number. And I don't know. I mean, they have the last two years, so I guess we'll see. But I, I do like Georgia State a little bit. In what does one. what does worry me is Elliot's been there a couple of years, and I'm looking at Georgia Southern 35 14, Georgia Southern 38 to 10. Uh, yeah. easy wins, easy covers. So that, that, that worries me a little bit. If you're looking to back the, the Panthers here, oh, maybe that's it. Maybe this is a, you know, historical type of movement where, you know, the last two years, Georgia Southern has had their way uh, in this rivalry game. So I guess we'll see how that one plays out. Speaking of having their way in a rivalry game, Kentucky and Florida, Florida laying 24 here, 60 and a half is the total. Now, two years ago, Kentucky beat Florida for the first time in 31 tries Last year, Florida gets back on track, wins the game. What do you think about this one? I did bet the over. I just thought it was a bad opening number uh, the, uh, by Circa. I, I bet over 57 and a half. I mean, come on, a Florida game in the 50s? I mean, uh, and, uh, we're back to the fun and gun days with this Gators uh, offense. I know that they didn't get uh, get real going against Vanderbilt, but I, I don't know what the – Kentucky announced some players, a lot of players out prior to the Alabama game. I mean, I don't know how you respond from getting beat by 60 points. So uh, typically I would say I want Kentucky here, but I, I, I'm i worried about what I saw last week. It might be wave the white flag time for, for the Wildcats who already are dealing with some emotion with their offensive line coach, uh, you know, passing away last week. So I, I over for me, and that, that's going to be my only bet unless this line moves significantly. I'm curious to get your thoughts on this because I'm watching the Ohio state game on Saturday and the early play calling, at least in my mind suggested that what the game plan was at the outset was to try and get Justin Fields back. Some of the numbers he missed the previous week against Maryland Mm. to put up 400 yards and five touchdowns against Maryland, if not more. So I feel like in that game against Indiana, they really wanted fields to have opportunities to put up numbers. And instead he maybe wound up costing himself the Heisman with some of the bad turnovers that he had in that one. I wonder if going forward for a team like Florida, if that is a consideration with Kyle Trask and if they're going to try to put it on teams in the first half, maybe instead of laying the full games, you take the first half because their defense does have some flaws but I sort of started thinking about that, especially with fields, you know, potentially kind of falling backwards in the race. Excellent point by you. Uh, I, and Dan Mullen to me is the type of coach that, that wouldn't mind padding Kyle Trask's stats. Trask is now the, the favorite. I mean, he's minus money in the Heisman race at this point. Does that create, I mean, I, again, if it, everything was easy, it was one-sided. Oh, I mean, you can, I mean, he's going to pad his stats in this game, but Florida, I mean, that'd be one thing, but, but also, you know, increased pressure. We saw that you mentioned with fields last week, maybe you start forcing the issue a little bit. Uh, we'll see if that impacts Trask in this one, but I, I do think that should be playing a part of any Florida handicap here down the stretch. They will be looking to pad Kyle Trask's stats. Mullen is the type of coach that will do that. So, uh, again, in, in normal situations, I probably would have taken Vanderbilt last week. I didn't because of that. And again, pr- this looks like you know a decent spot to take Kentucky, but I'm not going to do it because of at least that fear uh, that I have of that. Let's go to Pitt and Clemson here. And uh, obviously all the talk surrounding the Clemson program, how upset Dabo Sweeney is that Florida State didn't play last week. Clemson had a guy test positive, apparently a backup lineman or something like that. Florida State backs out of the game citing COVID concerns. Dabo Sweeney believes that Florida State was ducking Clemson. Not really for us to decide, but now Clemson's laying 24 at home against Pitt with the return of Trevor Lawrence, who hasn't played a game in, what, three, four weeks? Yeah, I mean, I got it at 26 with Lawrence in there. Uh, Not a high-value pick. What what I'm talking myself into is maybe the over. If you followed along with Pittsburgh, they lost a lot of key guys on their defense but some of their offensive stats were hindered because Kenny Pickett didn't play a couple of games. I think, you know, you're dealing with the mid fifties here. Maybe, Hey, Dabble wants to get Trevor Lawrence going. So maybe he keeps him in there. The, the full game, not that it matters. I mean, Uyunga Lele, uh, uh, he comes in and they don't miss a beat. 
I, you know, I'm really talking myself into this might be one of my favorite totals, but over 55 and a half looks good to me. I think that's sort of a question is, you know, the, the Notre Dame game is obviously what really sticks out in my mind because, you know, it's, it's really the first time Clemson had to absolutely step up. I know they played really well against Miami, but, you know, we've come to find out that Miami is maybe not that great. Is Clemson's defense that much worse than last year or was that just kind of a one-off deal? Oh, they're worse. And, you know, they're shorthanded. I mean, they're missing. I'm going to have to look at the injury report again. We're doing this on Tuesday. I, I don't have all my, you know, T's uh, crossed and my eyes dotted here. But, you know, does Skalski come back for them uh, on defense? He's the, the, their leader. If not, if they're still dealing with some defensive issues, then, uh, no, this isn't a good Clemson defense, at least compared to, to, to recent additions that we've seen. I mean, and they're – they're banged up uh, and they're missing three stars against Notre Dame and they got banged up even further in that game. So uh, no, I, I, again, I don't think it's a, 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 a really, you know, top level Clemson defense that we've seen from Venables and company the last five, six, seven years. Here's a game where, you know, you mentioned that you need to trust your power ratings. You need to play what your power ratings tell you to play. And, you know, one of the things that's hard for me being somebody who's a content creator in this space, and, you know, I'm always watching the market for different talking points and, and stuff like that. You know, I I sort of worry more about what everybody else is doing instead of what I'm doing. And, you know, it just kind of comes with the nature of the territory being the host of a daily podcast. And, you know, being, like I said, a content creator and all of that Northwestern and Michigan state. So Northwestern who had under four yards per play last week against Wisconsin, is laying 13 and a half here, total 42 and a half. Northwestern taking money when two weeks ago, Michigan State took a bunch of money against Iowa. That's been, I think, one of my holdups this year is that a lot of things in the market just haven't made a whole hell of a lot of sense. Does this line moving up make sense to you? It does from a power ratings aspect. I got a 13 and a half and, and missed opportunity for me. Uh, probably not the bet Northwestern. Just trust my power ratings. Should have, you know, just trusted them and bet them. I don't think it's a great spot for the Wildcats after, you know, that big win against Wisconsin last week, uh, a game that they benefited, you know, five turnovers by the Badgers. That's not ideal. Michigan State's off a bye, a little bit extra time to prep, although it wasn't a scheduled bye. And Northwestern is a team like Iowa that, uh, you know, that preference is not laying points with the stodgy offense. And even though they got a new offensive coordinator, and it looked good in their first game against Maryland. The, this Northwestern offense, just to, you know, it's it's same old, same old Northwestern offense is just not very good. And I, I just I'm not comfortable laying, you know, double digits in a conference game with Northwestern. It's just you know, again, it's it's so strange to me. How Michigan State two weeks ago can take a bunch of money on game day, then they have a buy, which yeah. maybe there's a COVID situation that people are worried about. I who knows? But then, but then this week. Money is coming in on the other side with an offense that is, is quite frankly anemic. And also, again, we've got a spread of 13 and a half and a total of 42 and a half. Like Michigan State has to be held to what under four, you know, 14 or under probably for Northwestern to have a chance to yeah. cover this, at least, you know, based on the expected team totals and all that. You know, again, and maybe you just you kind of tie yourself into knots worrying about all these different things instead of just focusing on you know, what's in front of you and, and the work that you've done, but it's been I'll, over, I, it's the, been a decade in this business and I haven't learned that part of it yet. So maybe after Michigan state, I remember Michigan state took money three straight weeks. They took That's money, true. big money against Michigan. People that took them got rewarded with an outright upset win. They took big money against Iowa. I couldn't believe it. Got their teeth kicked down their throat, that Michigan state money. And uh, third week in a row, Michigan state took money against Indiana. Those people got their teeth kicked down their throat. So I think the people that just got lost with Michigan state two straight weeks, probably a little hesitant to, to go back uh, to the well a third time here uh, and actually a fourth time with the Spartans. So maybe there's less of that money in the marketplace at this point. Got a line here that doesn't make sense to me. One I should have wrote about my power ratings article, but I didn't. Duke and Georgia Tech and and Duke it'll be 21 days between games for them it'll be even longer for Georgia Tech here when these two teams get together uh hopefully on Saturday this one's anywhere from plus one or minus one depending on where you look here with Duke and Georgia Tech and I've got Duke minus four so am I missing something here apparently I am yeah I think so I I got Georgia Tech one so uh, another one where I thought it was fairly priced 
Uh, I mean, and I want to say Duke seems like the, you know, the better side here. I just think Duke's underrated and maybe it, it goes back to the North Carolina performance where, where Duke, maybe you didn't downgrade them enough after they, they got absolutely walloped uh, against the Tar Heels in that one. Cause my ball rings are basically said bet on Duke for not all games, but, but a majority of the games this season, just because, you know, statistically speaking, they're more like an average team, and yet they're, they're sitting here at two and six. Why turnovers? Uh, Georgia Tech, I haven't bet, gotten involved in too many of their games, and I, I don't know what to get involved in this game. I just, I mean, neither team's played forever. Maybe under offenses won't be clicking. Again, this is a tough handicap in 2020 where I just, uh, too many unknown variables for me to get involved pre flop, but I, I can see why you have Duke favored. I mean, I don't think you're too far off. I mean, Duke minus 11 in turnover margin. They have 25 turnovers in eight games. Georgia Tech, though, they're minus seven in turnover margin. through. Yeah, they, they, they've they so had the same issue. They've had their issues. I, maybe Duke takes better care of the football. I don't know. I, I may end up playing this one on principle just to trust my numbers, but I could see why a lot of people would you know be inclined to stay off of that one. Here's a game where at least we should have a little bit more projectability to it. Oklahoma and West Virginia, Oklahoma, 10 and a half point favorite, total 55 night game in Morgantown normally would be an awesome environment yeah. here in 2020. It, it is not, but still not a great spot for Oklahoma coming off of Bedlam, another blowout win and the long trip up to Morgantown. Yeah, you're right. It's not. And that's why we've, I, that's why we failed to see Oklahoma money. I think we should be seeing Oklahoma money, at least on principle alone. The fact that they've won five straight, they've covered five straight. They covered five straight games by an average of 14 points per game. Uh, I just think they're, and it makes some sense. Their quarterback now has more experience. They're healthier than what they were. They got a couple of very key guys, two of their better players on the entire team, one on offense, one on defense back from suspension. They were out a majority of the early part of the season. So it makes a lot of sense that this Oklahoma team is kind of excelling at this point. But West Virginia off a bye. West Virginia has been, I would say, one of the sharp darlings this year. I am not betting Oklahoma now. What I'm hoping is some money comes in on West Virginia as we get closer to the game time. I, I, I will bet Oklahoma. I think it's going to be more maybe of the square play, but but I will. I'm expecting sharp money on West Virginia now. You know, if I can get ten or, or hopefully even nine and a half, I, I'll take the search. They're just clearly superior. I uh, I just think by far Oklahoma's by far the best team in this conference. Uh, no matter who they're playing, whether it's Oklahoma State or, or even a really good West Virginia team. Well, I mean, obviously it's important in any context, but third down is going to be remarkably important in this game. Teams yep. are twenty nine for one oh seven on third down against Oklahoma, twenty seven point one percent. West Virginia was up in the top five for a while, but. They've fallen back now to 37th as they've kind of played uh, some better teams here of late. Oklahoma's 40th offensively on third down, West Virginia 65th. So third down probably decides this game. So maybe a live betting opportunity to see in the first half who does better on third down. That may end up dictating the game. Uh, but I, you know, I really like West Virginia. In general, I purposely oh, wow. wanted to be high on West Virginia coming into the year. And I have been, and I've been able to cash some tickets on them. My number here is 11, which tells me that I've probably got both of these teams in pretty good spots here. And like you, you know, I'd probably have to default to Oklahoma because they're trending up. And I think West Virginia is just kind of staying on that same line. So I, I do yeah. kind of lean with the Oklahoma side a little bit in that one. What about some interesting line movement here in this Mac matchup, big Mac East matchup, 195, 196, Kent State, Buffalo, seven, the prevailing number in the market, 68. This was one on Monday where Buffalo took a little bit of early morning money and then somebody with significant influence came back on Kent State, dropped this number down from nine, nine and a half to seven. What do you think about it? So I can tell you why Kent State, uh, you know, I'm part of the early money on Buffalo and I can tell you why Kent State got money. Uh, I mentioned this last week. The guy that probably has as much influence on the college football market as anybody, and he's one of the very few guys that's actually winning this season, uh, he had his top play of the week on Kent State. So okay. I would say uh, that if you're wondering why – Was his top play last week New Mexico, or was that just a play? Uh, it was a play. Okay. 
Because uh, I remember we talked about that one and the influence that he had on the market for that game. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, even guys that, that, that you know, are, are big-time winners are going to lose, you know, oh, for, sure. probably, you know, between 40 and 45% of the time. Yeah, that was a miss there that, that I disagreed with. But, you know, does it worry me a little bit? Yeah, but, I mean, I'm hoping he has enough market influence where, you know, the number, you know, comes down to seven uh, because I'll take Buffalo. Uh, Buffalo is by far the best team in the MAC. Who in the hell has Kent State played? I know their their numbers look really good, but uh, they, they haven't played anybody the last couple of weeks. I mean, you, you talk about bottom t- tier teams, uh, Akron and Bowling Green. That's not going to wow me, even though they easily covered. I just again, I go back to it. Uh, Buffalo is the most complete team. Not a lot of holes in this Buffalo team. They have revenge for blowing a three touchdown lead against Kent State last year. I like the Bulls here. I already bet them, and I'm looking to bet them again. I, I mean, I have Buffalo minus 11 here, and I'm obviously going to have to make an adjustment to Kent State, I think, unless this game plays closer to my expectation. But also, too, Kent State, we talked about this earlier in the week. I think I talked about it on Monday. You and I have talked about this in recent shows, too. Kent State was great in the second half of last season, winning games, getting upsets, covering numbers, all that. They looked the part here so far. If Kent State wins this game outright and validates that money and that perception, perception is going to get even higher on this team. And I don't know if I'm going to want to sell them or not, but this is something you want to account for here that if Kent State looks the part, gets the upset, or at the very least is highly competitive, maybe wins the box score or something like that, this is a team that's going to have a ton of helium the rest of the way here in the max. So. If you want to bet Kent State, you're going to have to do it early if there's any value to do that going forward. Couldn't agree more with that. And, and I'll say another major macro point, Sean Lewis, their head coach, is going to get some looks then. Yes. If, if he's not going to be flying under the radar if they go out and beat Buffalo this weekend. He's really impressive. Uh, he's so, what, 35, 36? Yeah, he, he should be. I know Jamie Chadwell from Coastal Carolina is getting a lot of publicity and whatnot. And Napier at UL Lafayette is getting a lot of love. But the, the guy, at least in the Midwest, that should be getting more love is Sean Lewis. And yeah. uh, we'll see. I yeah. mean, <laughs> we'll, uh, I'm against him this week. So the, to each his own. I don't think a program like Cincinnati would change gears because Luke Fickle's going to take a, a major job here, I think, whether it's after this season or after next season, depending on what comes available this year. I don't think Cincinnati would shift gears and go all offense when, you know, they've kind of been that defensive type of program. But That'd be kind of an interesting fit, I think. Yeah, I got to think that they've maybe replaced Fickle with the defense corner. Um, Freeman? I, yeah, I think Freeman's that's... Freeman's a rising star, too. Absolutely, but if they just... Dude, so they held to lose... UCF to 4.3 yards per play last week. They're I bet UCF and had to hang on for dear life. That was one of my most fortunate wins I've had all year. There's not enough talk about what Cincinnati did last, because they only won by three. Like, nobody yep. digs deep. They 4.3 yards per play to UCF. I mean... Damn, what a performance. All right, in any event, a lot of games I kind of want to talk about here, but, you know, COVID issues, injuries, all different types of things. One game that looks to be a pretty straight handicap, at least, 225-226, Coastal Carolina and Texas State. Coastal Carolina, 17-point favorite, total pretty much 58 market-wide. Coastal coming off of that monumental win against App State last week. Texas State, I mean, I can't believe this. I know you tweeted, I think it was you that tweeted about this. They're actually going to play a full 12 game schedule, which is remarkable. They are, and they're excelling. They've covered four straight. I almost beat Georgia Southern, uh, co- you know, a couple weeks ago. And then last week did pull the outright upset over Arkansas State. Uh, th- yeah, I, I think it doesn't look great because they're two and nine straight up. But I mean, they impressed me at the start of the season, then kind of went through a lag uh, in the middle of the year. But uh, they, they're coming around, and I. I'm hoping to get 17 and a half. I mean, I like it at 17. I really like it at 17 and a half. I got an overlay here. Uh, Coastal Carolina, I only have 13. So uh, I am looking, especially after Coastal Carolina backers were rewarded with yet another cover last week, although it was fortunate against App State. I am looking to take advantage of it uh, here. I, I, if I, I'll say this because my newsletter isn't done yet. I'm going to give you guys – uh, I'm guessing Texas state's going to be a newsletter pick for me. One of my top picks of the week. I'm hoping to get 17 and a half as we get closer to the game though. Well, there we go. A little sneak preview there. Of course, your, your newsletter will be out by the time people hear the show. Yeah. But- you know, when I was saying that, I was like, <laughs> damn, it's already going to be out the way we're taping. I was like, man, it, 
I was trying to make it sound all cool, and it's not. That's yeah, all good. It's still cool. We story of my life. That kind yeah, of story. Talking myself off to girls, trying to sound all cool, <laughs> and the reality is, I'm not. Uh, well, you know, not all of us can be cool like I am, I guess. <laughs> what about the Iron Bowl here? 24 and a half now the number, 62, 62 and a half the total. I quite frankly agree with this move. I mean, I, I think it's Alabama or nothing. It's probably nothing for me right now, but I mean, I – I don't know how you could take Auburn here. I, I just don't. You're <laughs> going to take Auburn, I, aren't you? <laughs> I did. I already bet them. I took them at 25. Okay. Maybe I'm going to be dead wrong. I mean, Alabama's the best team in the country, and I think by yes. uh, by, by margin now. I mean, now we're talking at least three points better than even Ohio State and Clemson. Uh, if you don't at least have that, uh, th- then I think you're doing something wrong. I just hey, here's one where we're coming full circle rivalry game that I did end up taking uh, the, the the underdog the big one here I not but I also took because the number I have it more in the 21 range I, I did take the Tigers so uh I know they've been fortunate in a lot of games because of questionable officiating but uh, I just think it's a little Alabama's a little expensive this week all right let's go to LSU and Texas A&M here 14 now the number 64 on the total and this is another line move I agree with and this is one you could have gotten in front of if you had paid attention to LSU's box score last week, where they ran 38 more plays than Arkansas and got outgained in the game. So maybe people just really like Texas A&M, but I also think LSU very fortunate to win that game last week. And we're seeing that sentiment play out here in the marketplace, especially going to 14 and a half and furthermore at some of the sharpest global markets first. I understand that when, think i agree with the move although not the current number unbettable for me uh i just did and maybe it climbs even higher uh but a and has been off the last couple of weeks i know last time we saw them they absolutely annihilated south carolina i think AM is clearly i thought AM was a top 10 team at the start of the season and i think they're clearly a top 10 team right now it's just that this one for me has crossed the point where I'm just, I'm not going to, you know, recommend laying the Aggies here. Yeah. I mean, I have it 15, so at least it there moved towards my number. I mean, that's, that's always a nice thing to see. Didn't play it because again, I, I still have some concerns about A&M when they're playing teams with a comparable talent level, but also, I mean, I can understand, like I said, I have it 15. I can understand why it's going up. A&M has been really good this year. And as you said, you wonder if maybe there's a little bit of a rust factor, something like that. I may look to take a position on A&M live once I see how they kind of look off the 21-day layoff. There you LSU go. was off a long layoff, and obviously they didn't play particularly well. So maybe a live betting opportunity for that one. Last college game to talk about here, the Chase game, or the Aloha game, I guess, as some yep. people out there in the, in the markets call it. Nevada and Hawaii, Nevada, seven point favorite total, mostly 60 and a half across the board here. What do you think about this one with the Wolfpack heading out to the rock? So my biggest bet that I made at Circa on Sunday was Nevada minus two. I know it doesn't help anybody (laughs) at the current line, but I feel really good about that bet. Uh, I might take back though a little Hawaii uh, because I'm more in the, in the six range as far as a pure power rating, but the, you know, the Wolfpack have obviously exceeded expectations. Hawaii was getting trucked last week. They got a lot of fortunate things happen for them to score those last couple of touchdowns. Uh, Check out Scott Van Pelt's bad beat. Uh, (laughs) It's on there uh, as far as Hawaii getting multiple fourth downs and whatnot to, to backdoor Boise in that game. So, uh, it's crossed uh, uh, my power rating, but uh, I, I I really like Nevada early in the week. Seven, not so much. All right, fair enough. I, I got a hard stop here, unfortunately, with the recording. So I do want to talk a little bit of NFL here quickly. I want to cram some in here. And I guess basically all I'm going to do just to you know, get some NFL on here is, you know, are, are there some games on your radar, some games that you're kind of looking at here for this week? Yeah, I'm anxious to see uh, Minnesota, Carolina. I mean, two disparate results. Carolina hasn't had a bye yet uh, so far this season. They're one of two teams, Tampa Bay being the other. I mean, I thought they were running out of gas, and uh, they beat Detroit 20 to nothing. So it was one of my losers from last week. But Minnesota off an outright upset loss to the Cowboys. I just think it's a a decent bounce-back spot for the Vikings in in that one. Uh, Overall, you know, Tampa Bay, I mean, I – Tom Brady is, a, is more than a, a three-point home underdog. It sure sounds good in theory, but 
I'm worried about his age. He's starting to look the part. And again, Tampa Bay's a team hasn't had a buy yet. Uh, I'm worried that whether or not he can keep pace at his uh, advanced age with, with Patrick Mahomes and company. Yeah, I agree. Kansas City is one that I'm looking at here for sure. Um, I want to ask you about this Vegas game because I think this is an intriguing yep. handicap with Vegas, you know, who of course just played Kansas City, had a chance to beat them, played very well in a spot where the they entire did. world was on Kansas City. I did take the Raiders in the Circa in part because I thought, well, if the Raiders play well, it's a two-game swing because everyone's on Kansas City. Actually happened Smart. to work out in my favor, so so I do like that. But laying three cross-country against an Atlanta team coming off of a bad performance off the bye. And you and I talked about Atlanta and New Orleans on the show here, and I did like New Orleans. Wish I would have played them. Uh, I would have played them if Jameis Winston was the starter. That may have backfired on me. Uh, but – this spot sucks for, for the Raiders. And, and I know they have a lot more to play for, but damn, if this isn't one of those really difficult NFL handicaps. It, it is. I want to lean Atlanta. It's only a lean for me because I, I wonder what else they got to play for. Uh, I mean, if they were going to step up and really finish strong, it would be last week, and they just lost a backup quarterback off the bye. After you, the they bye were... is a detriment, man. It, it is for teams that are rolling, and especially with an interim coach. So, I'm lean Atlanta because the spot's so terrible for, for the Raiders, but it can't be a like with me. Cause I, I wonder how much, you know, now is, at three is, and seven is three and, and a half a buy point. Uh, it is. All right. Okay. Fair enough. Three and a half, uh, three and a half. I bet Atlanta. I don't know if it gets there, but you know, again, recording the show, you know, a little under 48 hours in advance of releasing it. You know, some of these NFL lines may move. I don't think it gets to three and a half, but you know, three, even money. Is, is that something you consider? Yeah, okay. it, I, I, it's certainly in the mix. Let's just sort of say it is early for me. I do a ton of uh, NFL work on Wednesday morning. Yeah, that's fair. No, that's fair. The only other one I, I'm kind of thinking about, because we didn't talk about this one with Brian Blessing, but New Orleans and Denver. I mean, that that's a hell of a number to lay with a low scoring expectation yeah. going out on the road to mile high. And look, if this number was like, this implies this number is what, seven and a half or so with Drew Brees? I'd be, on De- I'd be on Denver. Yeah, maybe even eight and a half. I'd be on Denver there. But right now, I, I don't know. I mean, Taysom Hill played at BYU. It's not like the weather should too, be too much of a Ooh, factor for him. Good point there. Good point know. that he played in, in, in altitude in uh, in college. I That wouldn't even have thought crossed my mind. I uh, want to lean Denver. I, I If there's one game that I really am kicking myself for not playing last week, it was Denver against Miami. I knew Miami was overrated, but I lost going up against some back-to-back weeks. People are getting mad at me, uh, and I just did, it was, didn't play it and should have played it. Uh, but I would lean Denver, but again, you can find some sixes out there now. It's kind of in that five-and-a-half dead number range, so I'm anxious to see where the line goes. One thing that is really interesting to me is that I believe nine of the 16 games this week – have road favorites. And mm. we know that home field advantage has been virtually non-existent this season, you know, with limited capacity. And in fact, road teams doing better because they can communicate better. So they've been scoring more points on the road, stuff like that. I'm curious to see how things kind of shake out this week, because, you know, generally speaking, you get sharp versus public disagreements with sharp betters taking, you know, the unpopular home dog, stuff like that. I'm really interested to see how the market takes shape and, by Thursday, as people hear this, it probably will have taken shape more than it has to this point. But those are always interesting weeks and interesting handicaps for me. They are. Uh, <laughs> I'm anxious to see how much sharp movement there is this week because I got to think the bank rolls are at the lightest they've been all season. Uh, and, I, and I know money management and whatnot, but when you get your teeth kicked down your throat like the Sharps did, uh, I thought last week, uh, unless your name's Adam Burke, and then you have a winner, winning week, <laughs> and he's playing meta games in, in the circuit contest. But I, I gotta think, coming off a disastrous week for from them, uh, it'll be very interesting to see what, where, where the moves are made and when they're made this week. And imagine this: like the biggest road favorites on the board, the Giants and Cleveland yeah. and Miami, like. <laughs> never it, it's 2020 encapsulated in one week in the nfl never would i expect those three teams to be the biggest <laughs> road favorites it's crazy yeah that is that does that basically if that doesn't define 2020 i don't know what does 
Yeah, right. Absolutely. Obviously, Seattle's in the mix, too, but. Professional better and handicapper Brad Powers from bradpowersports.com. What's going on over at the website right now, buddy? It's my newsletter. I'm working on it now. It's going to be a late night to get that thing out on Wednesday. Uh, it'll be out by the time you're listening to this. And if you want to get covered for not only college for the rest of the season, normally it'd be the end of the regular season. I'd be like, oh, you only got bowl games left. But hell, we, we got four weeks of the regular season left, plus whatever bowl games we play. So it's going to be a mad dash to the finish. And we also have five, six, five, six weeks left of the NFL season, plus all the playoffs. So you want to get covered for both NFL and college for the rest of the year. It's 49 bucks and you're going to get all of next off season, whether it's NFL draft props, whether it's early college season stuff, you're going to get all of it until the start of next season for 49 bucks to go to bradpowersports.com. It's called my powers picks newsletter. Then of course, make sure you follow Brad on Twitter at Brad powers and the number seven, Brad, always a treat brother. Thank you so much. Thank you for your flexibility this week. Happy Thanksgiving to you and yours, my friend. And we'll talk to you again next week. All right. Happy Thanksgiving to you and also all the listeners out there. I hope everyone has a happy and safe holiday. There you go. There's professional better and handicapper Brad powers from Brad powers, at Brad powers and the number seven on Twitter coming up on Friday, my picks for week 12 in the circus sports million 30, 24, and one here on the season. We'll see if I can navigate this road favorite heavy card. Uh, Last thing I'll say here, happy Thanksgiving to all the listeners out there. I'm very thankful for each and every one of you. Thank you for your support, both when we were Bang the Book Radio, now when we're ATS Radio. We have a very, very loyal listener base, and it means the world to me. So thank you so much to everybody that listens. I got a lot to be thankful for this year, even as shitty of a year as it's been for a lot of people out there. And I hope most of you have a lot to be thankful for as well. That'll do it for me. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. And I will talk to you again tomorrow.